Good afternoon. I'm John Kinesny, conference lay leader. And I'm Mike Biella, director of Connectional Ministries. It's again our privilege to be the opening presenters as we share the excitement of our 2014 Combined Leadership Report. What we are about to share is the result of living into our commitment to align all of our work to focus upon our annual conference mission and vision. Together, the Cabinet, the Connectional Ministries staff and ministry teams, as well as the Office of Growing Effective Churches, have intentionally aligned all of our efforts to fulfill the goals we have set as the Susquehanna Conference. John, I notice you used the word align a couple of times already. Alignment means that we first get a picture of where we want to go, and then we work together to get there. In the past, we've been less intentional about that and putting our efforts uh, into the mission and vision of the conference. And so even though we were getting a lot of good things done, we didn't often get to where we had hoped to go. Keeping your eye on the goal and moving toward it is your best hope of getting there. Yes, definitely. Our rural congregations know that when you want to plow or plant a field nice and straight, you pick out a point far off and keep your eyes on it as you go. If you try to plant a straight line by looking just in front of you, you simply miss the mark. John, that farming example <laughs> brought to mind a, a new chicken joke. <laughs> Not again. I'm just, I'm really sorry to hear that, Mike. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, John, why did the chicken cross the road? I don't know, Mike. Why did the chicken cross the road? To be sure, he was among one of the first to give his check to Bishop Park for the bishop's partner's admission. Yes, amen. Uh, I need more chicken jokes now. <laughs> okay, Mike, let's just move ahead after that foul attempt at a joke. <laughs> hey, I didn't write it. <laughs> Over the past few years, we have embraced the mission of the United Methodist Church as that of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. To help empower our local churches in that mission, the annual conference exists for a threefold purpose, and you see it up on a screen there. I'd like everybody to join me in reading each one of these, please. First, to train and deploy quality transformational clergy and lay leadership to lead the disciple-making task in our local churches. Two, to equip our local churches with effective tools and best practices for disciple-making in the 21st century and the, and the reformation of the church. church. And three, provide to provide a covenantal connection for mission and ministry beyond the local church. So John, and for all of you, in the next few minutes, we're gonna take a look at how we are doing in aligning our efforts to carry out those goals, especially currently around the goal of raising up transformational leaders, both clergy and lay. And to get us going on these details, we'll hear from two cabinet members, State College District Superintendent Lori Stephenson and Scranton Wilkes-Barre District Superintendent Marion Hartman. Hey, Marion, we get to introduce the cabinet part of the leadership report. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Lori, it is really exciting. <laughs> There's nothing I like better than talking about leadership and raising up new leaders. Mm. That must be why you enjoyed serving on the Board of Ordained Ministry, yeah. Huh? That, that is. <laughs> that and I like telling people where to go. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, where to be at the right times. That's right. <laughs> Disciples, getting serious come with many abilities and fulfill different roles. As 1 Corinthians 12 says, God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. 
Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, between spirits' tongues, and inter interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out by one, are handed out one by one by the one Spirit of God. God decides who gets what and when. God gives the gifts, but we have to develop that raw material. That's part of what raising up transformational leaders is about, providing educational opportunities and resources so that the church may glorify God. As the Book of Discipline says, how come I get to read the Book of Discipline all the time? I'm closer to God. Oh. <laughs> She's competitive, but so am I. The Book of Discipline actually has some really good stuff in it. Paragraphs 201 and 202. The local church provides the most significant arena through which disciple making occurs. It is a community of true believers under the Lordship of Christ. It is the redemptive fellowship in which the Word of God is preached by persons divinely called and the sacraments are duly administered according to Christ's own appointment. Under the discipline of the Holy Spirit, the church exists for the maintenance of worship, not the building. Oh, wait, that's, that was my ad lib there. <clears throat> the edification of believers and the redemption of the world. The Church of Jesus Christ exists in and for the world. The function of the local church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit is to help people accept and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to live their lives daily in the light of their relationship with God. Therefore, the local church is to minister to persons in the community where the church is located, to provide appropriate training and nurture to all, to cooperate in ministry with other local churches, to defend God's creation, and live as an ecologically responsible community, and to participate in the worldwide mission of the church as minimal expectations of an authentic church. So between scripture and the discipline, we sure have our marching orders, don't we? We sure do. But why do we need to raise up leaders? Doesn't that imply that we're lacking leaders? We are lacking leaders. God is calling and God equips those he calls, but I get the feeling sometimes that maybe people aren't listening or responding to God's call. Hmm. Every year we retire more elders than we ordain. Hmm. And to be honest, look around the room. In 30 years, how many besides me are going to still be kicking? <laughs> not me, not me. I'm going to still be kicking, maybe not real high, but I can still kick. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> later, later. <laughs> but really, my toes got stepped on this morning as I listened to the millennials. How many of us, well, we all have the ability to reach them, but how many of us have been doing that? And besides that, the numbers of unchurched 
millennials, ex-gen, and, and all the rest of us. Lori, in your district, there are some areas where there are 85% unchurched. Wow. We have work to do. So I know now why we need to raise up leaders. But why do we need to raise up transformational leaders? Doesn't that imply change? Uh, yeah, it sure does. Does that mean that what we did before was yucky? Yucky? What kind of word is that? No, it doesn't mean that what we did was yucky. We've done cool, groovy, awesome, <laughs> bad when bad meant good. <laughs> the reality is, well, the yucky went, went back to the days when we rode horses. Yeah. You know, there was some yucky there. But now, you guys are slow. <laughs> now we ride in cyberspace. We no longer have one or two fragments of the holy writ that we all must share. Instead, we each have the complete Bible, and if I was really with it, I'd have my iPad up here with me, because we can carry it in our pocket or our smartphones. The world's changing. One of the ways that we have responded to change is by developing the role of the assisting elder. The assisting elders provide resources, lead charge conferences, serve as mentors, and enable the superintendents to be in two places at once. Yes. And because of the assisting elders, we can invest our time in such things as PLD, EGP, and M28. Oh, PLD, EGP, MT28, oh my. Let's invent, invite our colleagues to expand on that alphabet soup. I think that's a good idea. Let's ask Kathy Kind, our colleague from the Altoona District, to explain PLD. So it seems as though you were stating the obvious when you mentioned how the world around us is changing. It has changed, and the church has struggled to keep up with that exponential rate of change. While our mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world remains unchanged, our approach to fulfilling Christ's mission has needed to change. We need transformational leaders to meet the challenge. One of the ways that we have been addressing this need for a new style of leadership has been to equip our pastors to be transformational leaders. That's what pastoral leadership development, PLD, one and two are all about. In PLD, our pastors gather together monthly to discuss crucial leadership topics, to read books that they have focused on that topic. And additionally, at the end of each session, our pastors spend time making notes, naming for themselves the key learnings to take away from that topic and then make note of an action plan that our pastors will be working on in the coming weeks and the coming month until we come back together again for that next pastoral leadership development class. And then when we regather, our pastors collect in small groups to check on the progress that they've made in implementing that goal. As valuable and as important as the education and the training that our pastors have received in preparation for ministry, we have found that that education has not necessarily taught our pastors how to be transformational leaders. So as an annual conference, we must be intentional in our own continued learning. 
the curriculum in PLD 1 and 2 challenges our pastors to focus on leadership skills that get the church to focus on our mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ. We do this by focusing on our communities, knowing our context, who are in our communities, and who are some of those 85% who aren't in our faith communities. We also want to be targeting those persons who really aren't connected to a faith community to create worship and faith formation experiences that connect non and nominally churched persons with Christ and also to create opportunities where those persons who are already churched and in the church to deepen their faith and their relationship with Christ. Sometimes this retooling of skills through the curriculum in PLD resonates. It makes sense. It's easy to hear. It feels easy to implement. It's comfortable. And there are sometimes it's challenging. It causes us to question how we lead in the church. And it's precisely in those places of challenge where we grow and we work towards becoming transformational leaders. Raising up transformational leaders is our hope for our people as we move into God's future. Now at this point, there have been about 200 participants, a few more than 200 in PLD1 and over 50 in PLD2. I'd like to ask those pastors who have participated in PLD1 or 2 to please stand. PLD continues to be an excellent opportunity for us to challenge our thinking to become transformational leaders. And so at this time, I'd like to invite Reverend John Goddessart, who has participated in leading both PLD 1 and 2, to share his experience of participating in PLD. John? You may find it hard to believe, but there are things about ministry they do not teach you in seminary. Now, I believe I received an excellent seminary education at Asbury, the alma mater of Bishop Mark Webb. But um, you know, with any learning experience, there are gaps. Learning this morning from hearing the millennia, so many things we don't know. It's essential for us to keep growing and to keep learning and developing. And I found PLD 1 and 2 to be excellent resources to help to hone in on some of my skills. Uh, any single one of us can walk down to the, the bookstore at Cokesbury and pick up a great book and read it. But what's so wonderful about the PLD experience, you get to discuss that book with your colleagues. You can open up about the good, the bad, and the ugly in your own ministry context. And you can dream God's dreams of where he wants to take you. There are also opportunities to take concrete steps to establish what you're learning in your own ministry context. Personally, I found through PLD, I'm a better preacher. I have a stronger desire to reach my community for Christ, and I have a deeper appreciation for many of my colleagues in ministry. So to, to mix up this alphabet soup that's going on all he, up here, I would say the UMC needs PLD ASAP. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I'm not sure about John. I, I, that's right, he belongs to you now. Um, PLD has and will certainly help our pastors. But Beth Jones from the Williamsport District has been helping to pilot EGP on her district. So what's EGP all about, Beth? I'm really excited about EGP. Uh, really excited. Uh, on, on the Williamsport District, we said, to, we said would, would you guys mind being guinea pigs? And the Williamsport District stepped forward, and uh, in two places we decided to try equipping God's people, EGP. Uh, and I was really hoping that at least maybe 12 people per site would step out. We had over 60 people respond to wow. become involved in equipping God's people. And, and the amazing part was they kept coming back month after month after month. <laughs> 
And, and they, there was a growing excitement among the laity for what they were learning. And exactly the way John described PLD, the opportunity to come together and to make action plans and to, to put them into use into their local church, that was happening and people were coming and exploring more and more ways to help their church come alive for Jesus Christ. If our churches are going to grow, then pastors and laity must be in partnership together in order to articulate and move towards a clear vision of what God would want them to do. Our laity are hungry for learning and growing in their leadership and faith. Equipping God's people offers them that opportunity to gather together, to learn new concepts, to focus on the mission and enact action plans which will help their church move effectively towards that mission. This year, Equipping God's People has been developed to give our laity the tools to partner with each other and with their clergy in effective mission and ministry. Happening now throughout the entire conference, laity from many churches across a, a particular region come together for Equipping God's People to learn and to stretch their knowledge of what it means to be a vital church today. Equipping God's people has been a product of our new leadership development team and is a model for future efforts in leadership development. With clergy and laity on the same page, excited and energized about their church's role in ministry to new generations, we move forward with hope in a clear, concise vision for God's future. Thanks, Beth. When we align our efforts toward the same mission, when we are equipped to follow God's call, hope becomes more than wishful thinking. We've also been focusing on pastors of various size congregations to help them meet the challenges that are unique to their size, because not one size fits all. That's where the Large Church Initiative comes into play. Harrisburg Superintendent Dennis Keller can help us understand LCI. Thanks, Lori. An important part of our Growing Effective Churches initiative focuses on equipping pastors and leaders of our largest churches. Large membership churches are defined as those that have an average weekly worship attendance of over 300. There are only 36 churches in the Susquehanna Conference that worship over 300. That's less than 6% of our churches. However, almost 20% of the people who worship in our churches each week are worshiping in one of these 36 churches. In other words, one in five United Methodists in worship each week in our conference are worshiping in a large church. These churches play a critical role in advancing the mission and ministry of the church. Over the years, pastors and staff members of our large churches have met to share resources and develop leaders. In 2012, a more intentional effort began to form peer learning groups for large church pastors, sort of a PLD for those who are serving in large churches. And I'd like to ask if you were part of a peer learning group in one of our districts uh, related to the large membership church, if you would stand at this time. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> These groups focused on things like preaching and leading worship, discerning and communicating vision. How do we develop staff and leadership, and how do we fund ministry? A few of our large churches now have had Matthew 28-like consultations, which have been tailored specifically to the unique challenges and opportunities of churches this size. And there have been pastors serving large churches throughout our conference who have become uh, mentors and teachers to equip all of our churches, many of them serving as coaches and consultants in the Matthew 28 program. 
Others are involved in developing new places for new people. Some of our large churches have already launched new congregations and others are in the process of conversation about that. The possibilities of our large churches to make a big impact for Christ in our communities are exciting. And this initiative is only just beginning. We want to continue to equip our churches over 300 and their pastors to extend their reach even further into their communities and to offer gifts that would strengthen every church within the Susquehanna Conference so that we can accomplish the great mission to which we've been called. I have the sneakers on, I got here first. <laughs> I heard Denny mention Matthew 28 a couple of times and the Matthew 28 program has been around for a few years, but Charlie Salisbury, Hi. York District Superintendent, mm. can you tell us how Matthew 28 has been transforming churches in the York District? I can as long as that push up things over now. <laughs> mm, I don't think so, Charlie. <laughs> um, our United Methodist mission statement to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, it's not meant to be a cute and catchy phrase, but it's the ongoing challenge that our God gives us to reach out into the world for the sake of the gospel. We do not serve a stationary God. Say that with me. We do, do not, not serve, serve a stationary, stationary God. God. How about a couple amens? Amen. All right. No, we don't serve a stationary God who is content with a church that does not grow. Instead, we serve a loving Savior whose grace aches to reach. Now listen to this whose grace aches to reach those who are not here yet. Amen. A powerful answer to God's challenge in Susquehanna Conference has been the Matthew 28 initiative. This initiative, which is now five years old, has been conducted in over 60 congregations with significant growth in half of them. Congregations entering the Matthew 28 initiative are twice as likely to grow as churches who do not go into the Matthew 28 initiative. In others, positive changes have happened which have reversed, reversed, decades of ineffectiveness and stagnation. 80% of the churches in the initiative significantly improved their trend three years following the consultation than three years before. The results, which have been innumerable, consistently reflect the willingness of Matthew 28 congregations to reach beyond the shackles of the comfortable and share the freedom of the gospel with their community. If you are part of a church that is not regularly and consistently connecting with new people with Jesus Christ, the question is not whether or not to enter the Matthew 28 initiative. The real question is, why not? Oh, I think Charlie got to preaching. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Some congregations have imagined a future of new ministries and new ways of believing that together is better. Tom Salzgiver from Lewisburg district shares about some of those congregations who sense God's calling to come together. The second chapter of Acts is about the beginning of the Christian church. The last verses of that chapter talk about how people join together for the sake of the gospel. The final witness in Acts 2 is really about a vital merger a vital merger of people coming together to work together, to worship together, to serve the risen Lord together. One of the most exciting things I believe happening in the Susquehanna Conference is that of vital mergers. Vital mergers are churches coming together to do ministry together in a new way 
and most often in a new place. Vital mergers are formed by people who believe that they can do more ministries, reach more people by working together. People involved in vital mergers often give up what they've known. They often give up the places where they have worshipped and sometimes positions that they have held because they believe that God can do a new thing when a new church is formed with two or more congregations coming together. Vital mergers aren't easy. They take months of earnest prayer seeking God's will. These mergers take honest and thoughtful discussion about what God is calling them to do, not what they want God to do, and how God can best use their congregations. These mergers also take a willingness of people to put God's mission and vision beyond, beyond their own desire to stay in a church where they have worshipped for years. In the words of Isaiah, God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing, particularly in places of vital mergers. Vital mergers are not accomplished because of desperation. It's not a last-ditch effort to survive and certainly not to maintain the status quo of we've always done it that way and we will always do it that way. Rather, vital mergers bring energy and most often a new direction to ministry in the community. Vital mergers occur because God's Spirit leads two or more congregations to understand that God's ministry can be accomplished when we join together because we can do better together than separately. In the city of Carlisle, three strong congregation felt their hearts and minds moved by God's Spirit to combine their ministries to serve even more effectively in the greater community. By coming together as one, they are discovering the limitless possibilities for the future. In a more rural setting, there have been two vital mergers. One is the Buffalo Valley Church, which was a merger of four small churches the day that each church voted to merge. Five to ten minutes later, they voted to sell every one of their buildings and to buy a new building so they could be in new ministry together. Another vital merger is the Roaring Creek Valley Church. Here is Pastor Chad to give witness to what God is doing through that vital ministry and merger. Maybe, maybe this sounds familiar. A church council meeting where the discussion revolves around what bills to pay and which ones we can't afford. Maybe the question of where did the young people go? Or maybe you notice that you're doing way too many funerals and not enough baptisms and weddings in the building. I'm guessing one or two churches out there might be like that. Um, that's where we were. Uh, my name's Chad Carter, and, and I have the joy and the privilege to be the pastor at Culp United Methodist Church in the Roaring Creek Valley United Methodist Church outside of Catawissa, which is near Bloomsburg. Uh, it, was, it was a year ago, June 2nd. Our churches got together, and they asked the real question before they voted, can we make more disciples together or separately? We loved our churches. We loved our buildings too much. But as you said yesterday, Bishop Park, that the mission of the church is greater than the conflict. The mission of the church was greater than our desire to simply survive. And so these three faithful congregations voted on that day to merge and create the Roaring Creek Valley United Methodist Church. The folks at Mount Zion, Fisherdale, and St. Paul's, they walked away from a lot but what they walked into was far greater. On June 29th, we're gonna celebrate our one year anniversary and let me share with you some of the things that happened in that time of chaos, of merger. I say chaos, but as I'm reminded of Genesis 1, our God does great work in the midst of chaos. Amen, amen. 
So before we merged, on a Sunday, the three churches combined would get about 85 people. In the last calendar year, we have averaged 128 people in our church. Our shares of ministry to three churches prior, one of them paid just their insurances, one of them only the health insurance, and the other not that. We are paying full shares of ministry. The 12 months before we merged, we offered $2,400 to both local and national mission. In the last 12 months, we have given $13,400 to mission, both national, international, and local. That includes a a miracle Sunday that we decided uh, we needed to do for our local food bank. So our brothers and sisters at Culp, we partnered up, and on that Sunday, uh, we raised $10,000 to give to the food bank. 5,000 came from these churches that weren't even able to pay their pastor the year before. We, We started before the merger with maybe 10 children. We have two children's church classes and routinely see 30 children under the age of 12 in our worship. We... We have 12 new families, unchurched families that have come after this merger. We've got a Cub Scout pack, and not just to host them, but they are part of our mission team. We actually include them on the mission team. They went out and helped us with our spring spruce ups. Three new small groups. We have a youth group. Not not only are we gonna do VBS this year, but we are gonna go to the campgrounds around Knoebels Amusement Park And for the month of July, we're going to do one-day VBSs at three of those campgrounds to reach people for Jesus Christ. (laughs) We're sending out VIM teams, uh, uh, folks to Haiti. Uh, We we have a worship team now. It's not just me. Uh, We have, (laughs) beginning in the fall, we're going to host AA and NA groups. It's amazing what God has done. Don't get me wrong, we have our problems. We have no room for visitors in parking, and so we had to start a Saturday night service so that some people could come Saturday night to make room for folks on Sunday. We have a fellowship hall, and and right now we can't all sit together and eat. And so we have a study group that's looking uh, for the best location that God wants us to be at. Folks, these are problems, but they're growing pains, and I thank God that they're growing pains and not the pangs of death. In the last 150 years, hospitals have changed, schools have changed. Church, it's time to change. Brothers and sisters, obviously God is not done yet. Mm -hmm. And neither are we. Another new and exciting effort has been birthed through the work of Dennis Otto and his office of Growing Effective Churches, the planting of new faith communities. Dennis, what's happening? Well, there there was little planting of new faith communities in either of the former conferences Uh, prior to the creation of Susquehanna Conference for several decades, there seemed to be a new interest emerging uh, throughout the area uh, to create new places for new people. In a conversation and consultation with Path One, the the group that throughout the United Methodist Church tries to kindle interest and support church planting, uh, we began to discover that there was interest in the communities as we went around the annual conference and in our conversation we found that interest stimulated. There's a question I hear periodically, folks say, why do we need more churches? We don't need more churches. We need more churches that are effective in making disciples of Jesus Christ, transforming their communities. And so that was the undergirding of all of this. Path One's strongest advice to us was to kindle the the starting of new faith communities in local churches, in clusters, as well as through the annual conference. 
At the time of that conversation, uh, Cross Point Church in Harrisburg was already planting through the launching of multiple sites with the addition of the Rutherford campus and Perking Point. Currently, uh, First Church in Williamsport has launched a simulcast site called North Campus where there's a live band and site pastor, but where the preaching is simulcast from another site. They're also developing a, a virtual site as they continue to develop the social media and the online connections, they're realizing that more and more people are engaging uh, online, and so they're trying to create ways to connect those people in community. First Church Hanover has opened Middle Street Campus, a distinctively new and more current worship setting and style in the former Lourdes United Methodist Church. New thing, a United Methodist community uh, launched in December of 2013 in a uh, strip mall between uh, High Spire and Middletown. It, it's reaching an underserved area which has a dense population and a high population of children. Begun in 2013 and moving toward launch is Nueva Esperanza in Cristo, a congregation reaching out to those who speak Spanish in Harrisburg. This congregation currently shares its pastor and its facilities with 29th Street Church. New Hope Church in Belfont area has entered a, a relaunch time. There was a church, I, I rather think an assemblies church that planted and it didn't work. They left the building for five years and kept it up but had no church there and then the United Methodists took this failed plant of another denomination and are using it to be a relaunch site for a merged congregation that now has a new beginning and is trying to remake itself to reach its community. There are at least uh, four other new faith communities in development. They're standing in the queue for the next couple of years and there are more on the horizon. One of the things I keep hearing is that uh, uh, this conference hasn't been very good at uh, new church starts. It's an odd comment. I'm not good with math. In fact, I'm rather dangerous with it. But by my count, there are about 880 church plants. I'm convinced that uh, these four in the queue are but a drop in the bucket, that there are literally scores that, that I'll see before I leave ministry, active ministry. And I'm convinced that God may have hundreds as we try to reach out and connect people with our Savior and the ones who follow Jesus. Thank you, Dennis. And what a joy it will be when we can say we were there at the start, at the birth of all these new places to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for this new life. Well, Lori, this gives us a, a great overview of the work of the cabinet to align our resources and, and focus on the goals that we've set as an annual conference. Yeah, it does. I, I think they get a sense of what we've been working on. And as much as I fear this, it's time to welcome back John and Mike to walk us through the rest of our report. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, John, mm -hmm. John, um, they did a pretty good job, uh, Lori and Marion, and yeah. you know what happened like the Bird Parks and Billy Crystal and those guys that don't longer do the shows, you know? Yeah, well, this is, it's like radio now. Might be out of a job, buddy. Well, what can I say? Well, okay. I, oh, <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, sorry about that, everybody. We're back with you now live. Uh, let's have a round of applause for the appointed cabinet and what they're up to. So, Mike, as we're getting near the report, as we've been told, only one joke, no tool belt, uh, no construction helmet, uh, no mind reading hats. Uh, yeah, it's kind of disappointing, isn't it, John? <laughs> I'm not saying that. It would be very much below me, John, to use any tricks or gimmicks or fancy gadgets <laughs> to help the Connectional Ministries portion of the report. 
Keeping in line with the goals of the annual conference, my staff and our five newly organized Connectional Ministry teams have been faithfully carrying out the task of providing resources, helping to raise, and raise up and train leaders, and holding up our Connectional Covenant together because we want to continue to be a people alive in Christ together. This year we completed our third round of e-tours. How many of you have been to an e-tour out there? Oh, that's terrific, wonderful. Well, wait, okay, that's, I guess they're not gonna clap for it. That's okay, Joe. <laughs> Gets hard at this time in the afternoon to get a laugh. Uh, but, but during that time, uh, we brought this past year even more in-depth experiences uh, around small group formation, missional outreach, VIM, designing worship, and neighborhood discovery for, for reaching out into the community. Over 450 of you were trained uh, by those events this year, and the dates for the next e-tour have already been set, one on each of our districts. You can find more information about that in Brubaker Hall. Seven district youth rallies and leadership training events were held since last annual conference, and this year I'm pleased to announce that we'll be partnering with Salt and Light Ministry to help resource the rallies in 2015, as well as continuing to raise up leaders from among our youth and young adults. Youth worker webinars and online training opportunities were also available to help raise up adult youth workers. Camping and retreat ministries, how's this for raising up leaders? 1,394 campers, 85 of those campers made first time commitments to Christ, 500 plus renewed their commitments. The camping program gave 117 scholarships for a total of $18,000, and I might add much of that came from your gifts and 500 plus volunteer staff shared their life and their faith journeys with our kids. We trained recently 28 small group trainers, folks who can come to your local church and help you develop small group ministries. Along with that, Safe Sanctuary training was held in a variety of locations and over 730 persons were trained and 18 leaders were trained to lead those events. Discovery Place continues to be a vital link with our local churches, providing over 1,600 resources last year. In the area of communications, the link, the Quick Link, Susquehanna Express, Media Weekly, website, Facebook, and Twitter, all is out there in terms of helping to resource your ministry of making disciples of Jesus Christ. Connectional Ministries provides grants. Many people don't realize that. We provided last year $16,000 in grants to 14 different churches for local church health ministry initiatives. 50 persons from 30 congregations received mental health first aid training. And there is a new piece of that this year being offered, new youth mental health first aid and you've probably been hearing the statistics about how critical it is to watch and help around teenage suicide. We offered mission insight training and consultations. Almost half of our congregations have now used mission insight to discover who lives in their neighborhoods. And volunteers in mission work, there will be 45, hear that, 45 open VIM mission trips available in 2015 and 2014. There will be 46 new VIM team leaders that have been trained. 215 people experienced their first mission trip since last annual conference. 30 churches have had our director, Kurt Nose, come and speak to them and over 1,400 people worked outside their church in the community and in the world. We, were, we, we are busy raising up young leaders through our commitment to campus ministry, as well as offering visioning, visioning consultations. My friends, the list could go on and on and on. 
And I would be remiss not to mention the five new connectional ministry teams that were birthed here a little over a year ago. They are now focusing on bringing resources to our churches aligned around our disciple-making mission. That is a lot of training and resources, Mike. <laughs> Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Mike, I know you often talk about equipping, empowering, engaging, connecting. But if you could condense all of those things that Connectional Ministry offers mm -hmm. into just one purpose, what would it be? Well, John, I do have one little video clip. Gimmick, gimmick. And, and I found this on YouTube about a gentleman who knows exactly what he's about. It explains everything that this gentleman is about, the purpose for his business existence. Watch this, 41 seconds. Howdy, y'all, this here's Mike. Down at Mike's golf shop. Where we buy golf. That's right. We buy golf clubs. Mike's Golf Shop. Come on over here. We buy golf clubs. Over at Mike's Golf Shop. Come on down here. We buy golf clubs. That's right. We buy golf clubs. 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 Are you saying you buy golf clubs? <laughs> See, because being clear is really important if you know where you want to go and what you're doing. So I ask you, what does he do? He buys golf clubs. Okay, so building on that idea, we hired the best actor we could get that could look like Mike, may even share a name with him, and we filmed this with absolutely no cost. <laughs> 41 seconds, this John answers your question, what is Connectional Ministries about? Hi everybody, how y'all doing? This is Mike from Susquehanna Conference, Connectional Ministries where we resource local churches. That's right, we resource local churches. We resource local churches. That's right, Connectional Ministries, where we resource local churches. Have us come on in. We resource local churches. We resource local churches. That's right, we resource local churches. So, Mike, what does Connectional Ministries do? Ask them. <laughs> Ask them. What does Connectional Ministries do? Resource the churches. Thank you. You know, my staff said that wasn't funny. <laughs> well, it certainly was different and maybe even more, or I should say less annoying than your chicken jokes. It does make a point, though. It does make a point. Which reminds me that we need to bring this report to a close now. Yep. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the Spirit of God is working among us. Do we have an amen for that? Amen. amen. Lives are being touched and changed. People are being fed, and homeless people are finding places to rest. Leaders are being raised up, and persons are answering calls to ministry, both clergy and lay. The word is being proclaimed and lived out in a way that reveals the living Christ in our communities and the world. Now, we still have a long way to go, but God is showing us the way. And together, together, we can be a living hope in the midst of hopelessness and grace to all those on a journey of discipleship. Thank you for having faith in all the leadership of your annual conference, for we are truly alive in Christ together. Bishop Park, members of the Susquehanna Conference, that ends this 2014 edition of the Leadership Report.